All right. All right, all right, all right. Are we live? All right, got check marks bunch. <laughs> I got check marks by a bunch of these. Uh, so it looks like I'm live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube right now. I am super excited to be bringing this video. We'll wait here in just a second, see if uh, any any people pop on before I get off and tangent. I want to make sure it's working. So I'll probably just click over for just a second, just a second, go on over to Facebook, just make sure it's streaming. I'm using a new software, uh, StreamYard, and really excited. I've, I've got a whole cool new setup here, which I did a lot of testing earlier, but I didn't really do any public, uh, public lives. So... Just checking in here to see if this is working properly. If you're uh, uh, seeing this, you can leave a comment. I should be able to see your comment as well because um, it says private chat. So I should have comments that should pop up and should be able to see that. So um, if you're seeing it, if you're on here, let me know and we will uh, we will go from there. So yeah, there it is. It looks like I'm... Yeah. Okay, cool. Fantastic. If you can see this, let me know. I can't quite tell if it's frozen. I'm using some new software here. So if you're if you're getting this, if you're seeing it, at least know there's one person working. I'm on a different uh, software here. So if you're getting this, I'm not going to go on two lines my first time using this software. So I just want to make sure we're good. This isn't frozen. It looks like I'm good, but I'm not sure. So if you're, I should be able to see your comment. Stream into a few different places, but this should show me all the comments. So if you're getting this, you can hear me. Uh, before I go off on a tangent for 45 minutes and uh, and explain this picture here, if you could just leave me a comment and say you can hear me, you can see me, uh, you can see the picture. Uh, can you see me? You can hear me? All right. All right. There's human beings. Holy Toledo. Good Lord. Facebook was down. This thing was not working. I'm like, come on. <laughs> All right, rock and roll. Well, how is everybody doing? Super excited. Good. I'm I'm glad there's some. Um, you should be able to see me now. All right, Joe, I'm here. Uh, super excited. Oh, now you lost my audio. Oh my god, this software. What is going on? Are we are we working, Joe? Can you hear me? It's probably going to go in and out when I take the pictures back and forth. Um, so I'll probably uh, just show me. I should be on the right here in just a second. So uh, you should see me on the left or the right, and then. And then you should see the picture. So, all right. It looks like it's working. So I want to get on here and uh, essentially share this image. Uh, and as you see at the top, it says ADHDers, creators, dreamers, doers, entrepreneurs, and neurodivergent thinkers become mechanics of your own mind. At the bottom, it says the mind mechanic. My wife called me the mind mechanic back on, uh, I believe it was June 17th of 2020. And... For a long time, I went by the moniker of the jump starter. And essentially, that worked for a long time. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I didn't know when uh, people uh, felt that I had helped them. I really didn't know what I did. And I didn't really understand how I helped. So I felt kind of like a jump starter. It's like, hey, you come in, you jump the cables, you plug in the cables, you jump the car, and off you go. And there was a lot of what it felt like I did because I would meet up with somebody, I would talk to somebody on the phone. Uh, anywhere I would be and people like, Oh my God, I feel better. I'm so excited. And then some people would say, I wouldn't be where I am without you. And that was great. And my wife called me the mind mechanic for a while. It was like, okay, I'm tuning up hearts and minds one at a time. So dreams don't die in their hearts, heads and hard drives. And the reality is, is it felt like you needed, you didn't know anything about your own car. So you have to go to a mechanic. You want the oil change, go to a mechanic. You know, you, you need the tires uh, change, go to a mechanic. You know, you don't know how to do any of it yourself. Some people do, of course, but most people don't. And so they go to a mechanic to get their car fixed when they don't know how to do something. 
And so it felt like what I was doing is like people needed me and I was the mechanic for their mind and I would tune them up. I would do what I'm doing right now, but they wouldn't know what to do. That was the jump start. It's like, give you a jump start. You don't know how to do anything without me, but at least when you're with me, you feel better. Um, and so during the pandemic, it's been very fascinating because obviously uh, for a lot of people, it was a very difficult time. For other people, it was a great time. Other people, they were indifferent. And for me, in a lot of ways, I essentially, a lot of things went in my favor. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but in the last 12 months, I had recognized something was going on. And so I, if a lot of people who've known me for more than a, a moment here, uh, I've gone by the moniker or not, I've, I've used the acronym MIA. So let me see if I have anything sitting here. I don't think I do off the top of my but. MIA stands for Massive Imperfect Action. And when I looked at my career or my life from like 18 to 30, I had a lot happen. I got to travel the world. I worked with people like Tim Ferriss and Tony Robbins and Richard Branson and Lewis Howes and a whole slew of other people. I shot over 300 weddings. I did some incredible things. I generated a few million dollars in revenue. I didn't keep that money because I was not good with the money. I was good at making money, but not good at keeping the money. Uh, but lessons learned. I, I look at it as winning and, and, and learning, not winning and losing. But what had happened is, is that I went from MIA to MOA. And MOA to me is not, MIA is a massive imperfect action. MOA is massively overthinking actions. So I thought I embodied MIA. And I thought I'm good on imperfect action. But it seemed as though the older I got, the less actions I took. And I could not figure out why this 18-year-old kid who didn't know what he was doing, had no connections, no relationships, no accolades, no air quote success, um, just a young whippersnapper, you know, ready to rock and roll. And so what I realized is something that I call stove moments. So if you think of a stove as a child or anything you could relate this to, but touching the stove, it burns and you don't want to touch it again. So in my life, what I realized is that from birth to 18 years old, I really didn't have many, we could call those traumatizing moments or emotionally traumatizing uh, uh, events. And so thank God I had a pretty good you know, childhood. I didn't have much to complain about. I didn't have much that was affecting me. I just went wide-eyed, bushy-tailed and took massive action. And that was great. Um, but very quickly, things started to stack. These stove moments started to stack. And now what I see is that as a now 36-year-old, uh, getting back into the groove of imperfect action, is that over the last few years, I had started to massively overthink everything. And I believe that that's because all these things started to stack. And now rather than moving forward and not being afraid, the subconscious mind had all these things that said, you've done that, that didn't work. You did that, it worked, but this didn't work. Don't do that. That might happen and you start to overanalyze things and it's the brain doing what it's to do. It's to keep us safe. And so last year, I don't know how many of you relate or know someone uh, or have been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I had heard, you know, ADHD, OCD, you know, these different words through the years. But quite frankly, I just had the stereotypical thought about it that probably a lot of people do at times, which is, you know, this hyperactive kid that just bounces off the walls and, you know, it was bad parenting or something. That was just the naive stereotype uh, thought about that. And last year with the clients that I was working on and some things in my own life, some things were coming up and some things came up around ADHD. And I thought, oh my gosh. Um, so I started to dig in and dig in and dig in more and do more research. You know, I was a person who used to do zero research and just act. And now I, I would do hours upon hours of research. And so I decided to get these brain scans from the aiming clinics. Now, when I tend to do things, I don't just do the like most basic way, which could have been, which I think a lot of people do, um, with different things, especially something like ADHD is you either one are ignorant to it. So I was ignorant. Two, you can go look online and watch some videos and um, 
you know, do some kind of virtual online diagnosis things that are pretty simple and pretty basic and be like, yep, that, that, that's probably me. And, and quite frankly, that might be as far as you go. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and subconsciously you could be doing that because you don't want to be labeled. You don't want to look at it as a, a hindrance. But for me, what I realized is that, uh, when I decided I had seen Dr. Amen, if any of you heard of Dr. Amen, the Amen clinics, I had seen him at a few different events that I had filmed through the years and quite frankly, never thought much of it. I thought it was cool. He was talking about Alzheimer's and he showed these brain scans and I thought, wow, that's, that's really fascinating. Well, there's some people I followed and he started to come up and I just thought I got to do this. I want to know, um, you know, one of the things he would say is, and, and, you know, I don't know, everybody seems to have different views on all this. So, much like anything and everything. And I know not everybody's going to be able to, to do something like this, um, let alone even afford a psychiatrist or something else to, uh, to formally diagnose you. But what I found is, is that one of the things he would say is even taking a car mechanic, a car mechanic's not going to just knock on your hood and ask you a few questions and then go, yep, that's definitely what's wrong with it. They're potentially going to get underneath the hood and really dig in. And then you know, there's MRIs, there's there's so many things where they'll actually look with different imaging and scans uh, to see what's going on. But when it comes to psychiatry and when it comes to diagnosis like ADHD, um, you know, people get asked a series of questions. And depending on what you read online, you can create a bias in your brain and answer these questions in a certain way. And quite frankly, get diagnosed with ADHD. And what I find is that I think a lot of people, um, especially in Western medicine, the automatic thing is to medicate people. Well, Pills don't teach skills. And that goes from, you know, you get migraines all the time. Like you can take things to mitigate the migraines, but why don't we get to the root cause of why the migraines happening to begin with? And I think that that's what I see is that from my understanding of everything from Dr. Amen is that, and I'll get to what's going on in this image in a second, is that you could have two people who answer all the, the same questions and then effectively uh, get diagnosed with, say, ADHD. But depending on what's going on in the brain, depending on what their brain would look like and where the activity is, if two people got the same, you know, Ritalin, let's say, one, it could work wonders and be amazing for them. And for another person, it could wreak, wreak greater havoc on them. And one of the things I liked about the aiming clinics as well is that is not their first approach. Their first approach is not to automatically, um, you, you know, uh, prescribe you medication. Uh, they go a more natural, holistic approach, do some education, understanding, and then go from there. Now, the interesting thing is, is that brain on the left, both of these are my brain. And one I'm calling flowing and one is focusing. So I actually went up to Chicago and got my brain scanned um, twice over the course of two days. One scan, which is the one on the right, was when I was focusing, and I had to hit the, the I had to hit the space bar. Can you all still hear me again uh, as well? Just want to make sure we're we're still good. Give a like, give a comment uh, if you're finding this fascinating. Uh, just let me know the audio is still working. So, one I had they showed all these letters and numbers, and the only time you were supposed to hit the space bar was when there was an X. So that was the concentration day. The other day, I'm just chilling out. This is my brain. Um, rocking and rolling and firing at all cylinders, what's supposedly normal. Now, my brain uh, on the left, the active brain, is also still not necessarily a normal uh, brain. There is a lot of activity. Now, I'm not a person who's super fidgety, can't sit still. I didn't have any problems really in school. Uh, no over talking, no acting out, you know, anything like that. But what I found uh, through my, my research is that a lot of um, – females specifically go undiagnosed and the effects of say something like ADHD has them get diagnosed with anxiety and depression because what's happening to them causes them to be anxious, causes them to be depressed. Um, and so the ADHD goes undiagnosed and they can potentially get help for their anxiety and depression when the underlying thing is actually ADHD. And so for me, I, well, and so the inattentive type in general tends to be the type that gets undiagnosed or goes unnoticed. And so that's ultimately what I have. And so for me, though, my brain's active on the inside. I'm not necessarily as active on the outside. Now, I have a lot of energy and people who know me know that. But at the same time, again, I can sit still. Um, I, I'm not like 
I don't have ticks. I, 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 I'm not constantly moving my leg. Uh, so none of, that, none of that's an issue for me. So uh, what's interesting is that in observing my behavior and why I titled this evidence of procrastination seen in brain scans is because what I have seen and observed, at least in my own life, and I can't say everybody will be the same here, is that the brain on the left is when I'm in my flow zone. So right now, more than likely, what's happening is the brain on the left for me. It feels good to do this. My brain's in the zone. It's flowing. It's fun. It's fulfilling. It's enjoyable. Um, all is good. It's an active brain for me. It's very active. Uh, it, it's stimulating. And all is wonderful. Now, what happens is, and we'll just tie this to the simple activity of why right now I'm live streaming uh, versus, um, you know, spending time like crafting an idea and maybe making bullet points and, and being able to have this whole outline, maybe even script this and record it and re-record it and edit it and do all that is that that would be considered focusing for me. That would be the concentration part on the right there. And my brain basically goes inactive. So the blood, the red and the white is like, the white's like over, overactive in the brain. The red's really active. And the blue's kind of, I guess, more of a normal, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's less active. And so I, when I'm concentrating, my brain basically just goes inactive. And so the tasks that are focusing tasks, so i.e., if I didn't go live here, honestly, this may never go out. Something, this type of content may never get out for me. Even though I'm getting help, the process of going through, this is why some of you know my background, I did same day edits for weddings. If I did not do the same day edit, I would not edit the video, right? So if I did not do the same day edit, I wouldn't edit the video. Well, what's going on there? Well, what I'm recognizing now is there's flowing versus focusing. So on the wedding day, I'm in my flow zone. I am I am flowing. I am having fun. It is fulfilling. It is enjoyable. There's a lot of stimulation for my brain to keep it active. But when I got to go back and there's not all this external stimulation and reward and people high-fiving and hugging and doing all that, stuff that my brain needs, then it goes into that right brain, the focusing brain, the inactive brain. And it is very difficult for me to sit down and work on that footage. Now, guess what? If the couple calls me and chews me out and wonders where that video is, it sends me into flowing mode. And all of a sudden, okay, I got to get it done. And I go into flow mode and I get it done in a uh, same period of time that I would have as the same day at it. But that's not necessarily good. Uh, because that's not necessarily an easily controllable thing. And so what I found <coughs> is that the more you understand yourself, the more you understand how you're wired, and the more um, you get in touch with why and why not you may or may not be doing certain things, you can start to design, especially from a professional setting, because for me, you know, I'm focused mainly on, uh, and I think people with ADHD, creatives, dreamers, you know, the, the neurodivergent thinkers, the entrepreneurs, like we think different and it's not just because we think different. Our brain is different, but what I don't like is that there is so much around deficit disorder, disadvantage, disempowered disability, right? All these words are not empowering words. Now, are people who are on the spectrum, who have ADHD, who are neurodivergent, are they at a disadvantage? Well, the reality is that depends. If you're around people constantly who are discouraging you from being who you are, i.e. a story that I'll give you around a fish and a bird. If a fish doesn't know it's a fish and a bird doesn't know it's a bird and a fish goes to bird school, and there's birds at bird school and there's fish at fish or bird school. The problem is if there's a total ignorance that the fish should be in the water and the bird should be in the sky, then what will happen is, is that fish will spend so much time wondering why it is trying so hard to fly and there's things around it that are flying and yet it's not. There are things that come in, these, these other things, these birds that within – Days, weeks, or months are flying, but it's been there for years and still can't fly. But if it got in the water, it could thrive. And there's still so much to explore and to be challenged by in the water. But some of us are trying so hard 
to do and be things that it's not impossible because as humans, almost anything is possible. But certain things are far more difficult for others than others. And so no matter how many hacks, no matter how much coaching, no matter how much um, courses, programs, I mean, endlessly what I could say in regards to knowing certain things I like knowing how to do things, but not doing these things, the things that basically are focus tasks. Um, I have come up with the concept that I call the Red Sea. So it's reduce, eliminate, delegate, or collaborate. And a lot of this stuff, it's like, it's good for anybody, right? It's not that it's just good for people who think different, whose brains are different. But if you need glasses. I don't know how many of you uh, need glasses or not, but if you need glasses, right, you can't just with pride and ego and all these things go, why I'm not going to wear glasses and just, and not wear contacts and not get surgery and not do anything. And you're just going to make it harder just because you're a cheater. If you use glasses, you wouldn't do that. That doesn't make any sense. The problem is, is there's a lot going on where effectively there are, there's an ignorance around the fact that if again, two people, one has 20, 20 vision and one doesn't, and neither are aware that glasses exist. And of course the one who has great vision doesn't need them anyways. If the person who needs glasses, it's talking to a person who doesn't, and both are ignorant that glasses exist. Then what'll happen is when you're complaining about the issues that you have with your eyes, they're not going to understand because at times they don't experience that. So they're going to say, well, you don't need that or just practice or just shift your mindset. And what I found is, is that's horrible advice because that doesn't work, right? There is something called the Bates method where naturally over time, it's really difficult and seems that most give up. You could potentially improve your eyes versus getting glasses, wearing contacts or getting surgery. And so, yes, there are things that can be done at times, but why make your life more difficult than it really needs to be. And so a lot of courses and programs, what I'm finding is, is this is what's happening. There is a unawareness that essentially a person with 20-20 vision has created a course for people who have 20-20 vision. And so there's people who come in, thousands of people who come in, and there's people who are winning, and there's people who it's working for. And the people who it's not are automatically blamed as stupid, dumb, lazy, and all these other things. But what I have found is, is there's something going on. I have been obsessed with what is going on. People are not that stupid. They're not that dumb. They're not that lacking of information or knowledge. How many things right now, like we have so much between AI and YouTube and Google and books and just courses and programs and blogs and blogs and things that are free and cheap and expensive. We have so much available to us. The information is not lacking. And so why I've been in business for myself since I was like 18, 19 years old. And I can see certain themes that have been present in my life since I was 18 years old. These things have been there the whole time. In and out, in and out. I've seen when I've thrived. I've seen when I've barely survived. And when I've thrived, I've had support and people around me that were basically, if the fish wants to do something in the sky, it should collaborate with people who fly. And that's what I was doing on accident, not on purpose, right? A person who doesn't need glasses, if they want to wear glasses, it's like nice to do. It's an aesthetic. They look cool. But for a person who basically needs glasses, it is a need. It is not a nice to do or nice to have. So what I have found is that there are people out there where they're trying to be normal when they are not normal. And the trying to be normal is what's making life more difficult. If you embraced versus disgraced who you are and began to understand who you are, then life would be so much easier. And so for me, these brain scans have helped bring a visual for me, not only to understand myself better and what's going on, but to recognize where there's a hard line in the sand that I'm going to stop doing another F, which is fighting certain things that no matter what I likely do over the rest of my life, I will still run into the same issue over and over and over again. And so 
there are people out there who do really well in business who have just accepted some of these things. They don't they don't keep rejecting and wishing that they were something other than that they are. And see, the interesting thing is, is that people who, you know, have been in school or went to school from, you know, preschool through college, even maybe imagine for a second, all through that, if you were bad at math, could you just have somebody now? Some people did this, but if you had somebody, if you were bad at math and someone else did your math work, would that be accepted? Would that be encouraged? Would that be a good thing? They'd be like, good job, Johnny. I'm glad you had Susie do your math homework. Good job. We're giving you an A on that. No, of course not. You, If you got caught, you would get in trouble, right? They would be reprimanded. You would get in trouble. You would be considered a cheater. So if you're told that that is bad, that basically getting help asking for help or literally having someone else do something for you that you know you're not good at, you're told to learn it, learn to become better at it, learn how to do it, to do it yourself. You need to learn this. You need to do this. You need to push through. You need to force. You need to push. You need to jam the square peg into the round hole, right? But in entrepreneurship, getting help, asking for help, delegation, these are like some of the cornerstones of being able to succeed. And so, so many people are trying so hard to do things that the likelihood is nothing overall will change. You will continue to struggle with this for the rest of your life. And, and, or you can reduce, eliminate, reduce that thing, eliminate that thing, delegate that thing, or collaborate with people for that thing. And so I have recognized that content. Perfect example. I am not lacking knowledge, experience, expertise, know-how, drive, or anything else to create content, right? And put content out. I know how to edit it. I know how to shoot it. I know how to upload it. I know how to title, tag, descriptions. There's so much software to help you. There's so many things that I could do that. And over and over and over again, I have done that. And if I do not get help, I will stop doing it. Because doing what I'm doing right now, this is, this is flowing. This is fun. This is enjoyable. This... On the right there is where I'm at on the left, right? Flowing. But when I go into all the tasks necessary, it goes into focusing and it gets really hard and I procrastinate and I have done it over and over and over again. Then those become what I call stove moments. And the stove moments are you've already put out content before and you quit. You 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 put out content before and you quit. quit. Right? We can make a jingle out of it. Because I've done it over and over and over again since like 2012. I've done things. I get on these sprints. I don't get any help or I get a little bit of help sometimes, but I don't know where the right place to get the help is. And and I believe "Ah, I can just do it. I can't afford it. You have these mini beliefs. And then you stop. And I've recognized there's areas where I won't stop. And there's areas where I will always keep stopping. And it's not a mindset belief, limiting belief thing going on. It's something literally going on in my brain and in my body. Right, that, that is is not impossible, but much more difficult to fix. So why why fight that? So, anyways, I can go on and on here. I'm obviously very passionate. I'm curious. There's been people coming on. I don't know if some of you've been on here the whole time. You've been on for uh, for five minutes. Uh, you've been on for five seconds. Curious if you have any questions, if anything's related, if you're curious, because that's one of the things I love. I mean, it's one of the reasons I ended up doing this. I was doing some stuff yesterday where I was recording a bunch of videos, kind of by myself and and whatnot. And I realized I'm like, God, knowing at least some human being is listening does something for me. Right. And I used to think, well, you can get over that. It's like, yeah, I, I can. There's a lot that I've done to do that. But for some people, it's far easier than others. Like some people don't really ever need to necessarily connect with people. They love creating content in isolation. You know, my wife can go in her creative office for hours and doesn't interact with the soul, listens to podcasts, you know, and loves it. It's so effortless for her. In fact, it'd be different. Like her flow state is more that. Whereas for me, creating in isolation and creating alone versus creating in collaboration, I thrive in collaboration. So what I would tell myself or what I tell anybody else, why would I keep fighting needing to create an isolation? It's like fighting against who I am. 
For what reason? Is it necessary? Depends. So anyways, I hope you found that valuable. Trying this new software, StreamYard, that is is really cool. It allowed me to easily uh, share this. One of the other things I'm going to start doing potentially is uh, – one of the things I do with a lot of my clients is when I'm working with them, things pop up. I watch lots of content and learning, and I create a lot of clips. And so I take those clips. We'll go ahead and do one real quick, see if anybody has any questions. But I'm going to take a um, – um, let me grab one of these uh, clips for a second and show you um, what I'm talking about in regards to – one of the guys that actually went to the aiming clinics that I really look up to, who was uh, basically divorced twice, uh, or divorced once and bankrupt twice by 34. People with ADHD have a higher probability of getting divorced, um, you know, going bankrupt because of the, yes, deficits that they have if they don't learn to uh, overcome these things and so and learn to harness them. And so, yes, the people I mentioned in, in, in this video, the ADHD years, the creators, dreamers, doers, entrepreneurs, neurodivergent thinkers, like if they don't learn to harness their superpowers, then it's a, it is a massive disadvantage. Uh, one second. So, so I want you to hear this. This guy now has a, you know, 30 to $50 million company and 150 employees and you'll hear him enforcing what I'm saying in regards to like, what is your sweet spot? What is your unique ability? What is your flow zone? And then accepting that and recognizing tasks that you're likely to not procrastinate on and tasks you're likely to procrastinate on. That's flowing versus focusing, right? And um, now I can get into a flow zone that looks like I'm focused, but it's a different task. If my brain has to start like processing too much stuff and you know thinking through things and creating bullet points and doing all that, I'm just like, I'm done, right? So at times I get focused for hours, but there's a different type of focus for me. There's a flow focus and there's a non-flow focus. So let me share this clip with all of you um, from Dan Sullivan and we'll uh, we'll go from there. It is I, I can do detail work really well for about three hours mm -hmm. and then I'm tired for two weeks. OK, if someone's unique ability, they can do that thing every single day and love the experience more and more as they go along, you know, and the, and that's really the thing. It's it's not that you can't do it in a pinch. It's not that you can't do it when you're up against an emergency. I can perform in all sorts of task areas of its emergency as long as I know I don't have to do it tomorrow. Unique ability is lifetime in the same in the same niche. You know, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's very, very I mean, it's very, very interesting. You brought up Belichick because. So what I love about that, right, unique ability. Something that when you do it and you do it more, you want to do it more. You want to learn more. You like it more, right? It's fun. It's enjoyable. Things that are not unique ability. Uh, well, <laughs> well, things that are not unique ability. When you do it once, you never want to do it again. Now, there's a difference at times when you're not good at something and you do it. And it's like, I'm not good at this. But over time, and especially those in their 30s and 40s, you probably tried a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. You've experienced and experimented with a lot of things. And the truth is, is that when you start to analyze those things, you know there's areas that you haven't been good at, and you might know that, but you're excited to get better at it. You genuinely want to get better, you want to learn, you want to practice. But then there's areas that, like, you wish you never had to do. And to me, yeah, anybody is a, everybody who's a human overall is a hybrid. We're all hybrids to some capacity, right? So we can all be chameleons and go in and out of doing certain things, um, unlike there's gas-powered cars, electric cars, and hybrid cars. The thing is, is that the, uh, as humans, we're all hybrids, but a lot of us lean in one direction or the other. But the fact that we're all hybrids has us confused as to, well, I could learn that. I can do it. Yeah. But if you've struggled with it for the last 12 years, you maybe really need to look into that because I would argue that unless you're absolutely unaware of something that 
there's certain things that when you start practicing, it won't take you 12 years to get better at it if you're actually practicing. Right? If a person genuinely wants to play the guitar, wants to learn the guitar, has great guitar, even, even mentors and coaches, and you're practicing on the guitar five hours a day, and you've been practicing five hours a day for 12 years, and you still can't play any songs or any music or anything, something's wrong there. <laughs> something's wrong, right? And so that's how I felt with certain things in my life. There are things that no matter what book I've read, no matter what courses, coaching, accountability, or anything else in between that I've had, I've still struggled with it. And then there's other things that it doesn't take me weeks and I become start to become better at it. So um, anyways, it's great stuff. I, uh, I'm excited to be on here today. This is one of, uh, you know, new test of, of getting on here and, and, and playing again with the technology and potentially having an editor after the fact go through these kinds of content so I can record you know, a longer form, um, you know, hour, two hour long thing, and then have that be spliced up into to shorter videos. But just the fact that I know there's a few people on, uh, gets me more excited than sitting here for three hours recording this alone, because, um, I know that I wish the things that I am learning that I'm finding out, I wished more people shared. But what I find is a lot of people who think like me just go, I don't want to mess with any of this. So they don't. So it's really hard to find content from them. Um, and so I am finding the ways to be able to get stuff out there because I really believe in this mission of helping ADHDers, creators, dreamers, doers, entrepreneurs, and neurodivergent thinkers become mechanics of their own mind, right? Not to need a person like me or anyone else to really like hold you accountable and all that stuff. Yes, you might need support in certain areas in life, but I want you to be able to work on the most important thing, which is your own mind, your own body, your own spirit, your own soul, and for you to understand things in ways you've never understood things before about yourself so that you can better navigate life. And rather than having it be uh, a struggle, uh, you know, you can start to identify your strengths and you can have a more fun, fulfilling life and go in the directions that are going to work best for you and steer clear of the directions that potentially won't. Um, and so really, really excited about that. So be sure wherever you're at, if you're on here on YouTube, finding this and you don't know who I am, be sure to click subscribe. Um, you can head over to the mindmechanic.net. And uh, if you're interested in, 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 in working with me, I work in a very uh, unique way. I call it coaching your pocket. And essentially it's asynchronous. I, I was tired of all the, I got to be here at this time. I got to do this at this time and two o'clock and all these zoom calls and all these things. And I have developed since 2009, a really a process of coaching people through this app called Voxer that has just been a game changer. And, um, and so you can go over there, find out more information about that. You can also check out my audio books. You can subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to YouTube. I'm excited to uh, start bringing out more content here in the coming weeks and months that can help people who are basically brain different. Um, those who don't fit in, those who who uh, feel like they've always been uh, misunderstood, you know, the misfits, the misunderstood, the outliers, the outsiders, right? Those who, who basically don't fit in. Um, and I say you don't have to, but there is a world where you do. Um, but it's not in the way that you've probably been trying to. It's not all the people who are telling you you're a disabled, dis, disadvantaged, uh, disordered, all these things. It's like you're different. Yes, that is true. And if you don't understand your differences, then you will be at likely a major disadvantage. But if you understand your uh, differences, you will be at a massive advantage because a lot of the technologies today were designed by people who were brain different. So that just may be you. When you embrace you rather than disgrace you, you can do amazing things in your life. So I'm here to help. I'm here to help you become the mechanic of your own mind. So if you enjoyed this, if you have any questions or thoughts, let me know. I'm excited and keep rocking, keep rolling, and we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye.